Bobby, why would we start with a scripture reading like that? I mean, I thought we were here to talk about the good news about God, which we are. But until we are honest about where we are, we will never see it. No matter how many pictures I draw and no matter how many verses I quote or that you do. We watch the children of Israel. We see their dilemmas, their crises. We see them make serious mistakes. We see them rebel against God and have idolatry. We see them crucify the Son of God and we sit in our pews today and we say, that's amazing they did such terrible things. I can't believe that they did that. And if I were there, I would not have done that. And by testifying that way, we testify against ourselves that we are the children of them, right? I've, I've been hearing a lot in our churches uh, today about prayer and about the need for prayer and about power of prayer and about prayer warriors and about prayer activities. But I want you to just consider this as you move forward in the weeks ahead. The Lord does want us to pray. But if we pray, and we haven't yet first grasped what's in what was just read, our prayers will go nowhere, and they'll get nowhere, and they will accomplish nothing. If you don't believe me, try Isaiah chapter 1 in your own studies. Because it shocked me there when it said, though I pray many prayers, he will not listen. And it shook me, frightened me. What do you mean? I was taught that no matter what, he will hear me. And yet here was a scripture verse telling me that no matter how many prayers I prayed, he would hide his face from me. And then he would not listen. And I had to say, wait a minute. What is going on? What, what could be happening in my life that would cause such a, a reality, such an activity? There is good news. We're going to talk about it now. I'm, I want to say just real quick, though, for those of you who might, that some of you told me you have to leave uh, and you're not staying for the afternoon. When we're done, we're done at 12, right? 12.30. Oh, you're going to give me a whole hour. Okay, you'll, you'll wave though, right? If, if you have to leave uh, right when we close here or shortly afterwards, uh, please stay by. I'll stay right here. I'm not hungry, so I'll stay right here and, and visit questions if you have got to, want to do them before you leave. Also, the wrath piece. Uh, which we didn't finish in Sabbath school, which is okay. We're actually going to work on it some now, but more details if you want to do it either right after, before lunch, or if you have to leave, as well as we said 3.30. So we're going to just be available, right, for us to work on and talk about that. But for, for church right now, coming out of that prayer of Daniel, Lord, we have sinned against you. We have not read the testimonies from the prophets. We have not taken seriously what they're saying. We, we float about in this sort of soft, mushy area of if I could just, you know, have a nice God. If I could just find a, a church that will be nice to me. If I could just find a place where I could find some peace. And there's good reason for that. When the heavens were shut up on Israel, that it rained no rain, how long? Three and a half years can you imagine how hungry they were? I mean, the king himself, it says, was out there looking for water. Kings don't do that. Kings have servants to do that. Kings send their servants on missions to do that. They, they don't do that. The king himself was so hungry and so thirsty that he was out hunting for water. And there was none. They found nothing but dust and dirt. And I don't know how you eat that or how you live on that, but the people were hurting. Their hearts were, were broken. They were, they were groveling around trying to find some way to have peace, some way to have some sense that God was taking care of them, but their God was not taking care of them. And I don't mean Jehovah. I mean Baal. Because that's who they had chosen. And since that's who they had chosen, God, God needed to allow them to go ahead. You try how that's going to work with your God. See, God is so loving that he's willing to let us try it our way. Oh, you want a king? Okay. You don't want me as your king, God said? No, we want a king like everybody else. We would have a king like the rest of the world has a king. Okay. 
You're sure about that? God asked. Because, because if you choose that, here's what's going to happen. And then he lists it out. This is what's going to happen. And if you've read that before, it's not a very nice sounding list. And yet, what did we say? We don't care. That's the God, that's the king we would have. And so God must step back and he must say, though I love you unconditionally, though I forgive you even before you said that. Isn't that right? That's the story of the prodigal son. Prodigal son says to his dad, I would have my inheritance when? You need to die now. That's what he said. To me, father, you are dead. I want you dead because I want my stuff. I would have a king that the rest of the world wants. In his case, what was his king? Money, stuff, entertainment. Uh, what else could we list there? Uh, Self-indulgence, right? Uh, desire for what makes me happy. And we grovel for it, trying to figure out what is going to bring some peace in my life. We're stressed out. We're religious, but we stress out. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Roberto. <laughs> this morning for your confession because until we're honest until we can read daniel 9 and say you know what we have been worse than them until we can read that and really come to grasp with we are starving the rain can't start right because they came to that point and when they were start when they're finally and they had been trying to kill elijah Right? If we could just kill that guy, this was their theology, if we could just kill that guy, finally our God would be happy enough and he would change his attitude towards us. He would stop being angry with us for letting this blasphemer walk into the king's you know, courtroom and, and tell the king a thing or two. We, we, we have allowed that blasphemy here and so God is angry with us. That's, that's what the prophets were teaching them. You have, to, you have to clean the garbage out of your church. You have to find the ones that are problem people and you've got to get rid of them. That's what they were teaching. In this case, it was one guy, Elijah. But they couldn't find him. And finally, they got so hungry, the king himself is out there looking and Elijah comes to, to the king, right? And then begins the whole contest. We'll finish that story for those of you who are going to be here this afternoon. <clears throat> but we really need to be honest about that. So coming to the good news... The good news has to do with the judgment of God. Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his has come. And we're excited about telling our neighbors about that, right? No? Why not? Huh? Fear? Fear of what? Fear of rejection? Fear of laugh at us? How about the message itself? Do we like it? How, how, why do you want to tell your neighbor about something you don't like? Fear God and get... We have been saying that that is about God finally going to whip up on people. Finally, they're going to they're get what they deserve. I remember Bible class when I was in academy. And we were having this discussion about the final events and the final end and so on. And... and <clears throat> You know, some of us had questions about that, so we were asking questions about God's love in the middle of the time of trouble. And, and, and at the third coming, you know what I mean by that? That's not a biblical term. That's after the thousand years, right? And he comes back again to the earth, right, with all the saints. We were having a discussion about that, and I remember my Bible teacher saying, I, you know, I wanted to know, uh, did God love those people, the, the wicked? You know, and what was going to happen to them at that time? And my teacher said, you know, that's going to be a great day because we're finally going to see them get what they deserve. I'm exaggerating it just a little bit, but those were his exact words. And it troubled me. I went away from that, and I, could, I couldn't drop that question for, for a long time. Not that I figured it out real fast, and not that I thought about it every day, but it did trouble me. And so here comes the good news about the judgment. I'm going to do this one. Uh, kind of, uh, sorry, I left this up here because I thought maybe we should do wrath, but uh, we're going to actually mix it together with justice and mercy here. And here's how it goes. Our line down the middle is simply to define the difference between two different opinions, two different altars or theologies, if you will. So I'll put one here and one here so we can do a comparison. 
Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. How does his judgment work? What, what is it exactly that he's doing? Is he sitting on a throne and deciding who's in and who's out based on your track record? So we have this concept in our psyche, in our mind, in our, in our country, in our world that says, well, if we have a convict and that convict is 100% guilty, I, I mean, we're not going to deal with is he really guilty or really not. This is like uh, tons of witnesses, everything agrees, all the evidence, there's no disagreeing evidence whatsoever, 100% proven guilty. If we have a, a convict who's proven guilty and then is brought before the judge, uh, the judge now has to do what we call sentencing, right? So will he sentence him to uh, jail or will he set him free? Will he, will he sentence him to life in prison or will he sentence him to minimum security short term out on probation? Will he, will he sentence him to the death penalty or will he uh, give him another chance? The reason I describe it that way is because we're looking for what is the definition of these two words, justice and mercy. Justice says if the convict is 100% guilty, that judge should send him where? Jail. To jail. So I'm going to put a big J right here for justice. And mercy says? We're a little hesitant on that because we're not sure we want him free, right? We're not sure we want that murderer living next to us. And so you should have a little trouble with that idea at first because how does that help us or him? But nonetheless, justice and mercy in our definitions of the word, justice is you get what you and mercy is, you get something you don't deserve, right? So we have two opposites here. Justice equals what you deserve. And mercy, something you don't, i.e. a lighter sentence. The actual dictionary definition says a lighter sentence, a smaller payment, something less than the due penalty, okay? And that is how we use those words. And then we come to our scriptures and we read about the justice of God. And we're not sure we like that part, so we look for verses to talk about the mercy of God, because we'd much rather have some of that. It's more hopeful, it's more helpful, it makes me feel better. But then we come over here and we read things about, you know, like the prayer of Daniel. And we read about the plagues that came. And we read about Sodom and Gomorrah. And we read about, and justice starts building up in our mind again. And we get worried. And we're afraid of that whole, what is God going to do to us? So we run back over here and we look for verses that talk about mercy. And back and forth we go. Do we not? In our hearts and in our minds, we have this schizophrenic sort of approach to this. Because this is the system upon which we've learned it. Right? But even in our system... We try to do as many things to make it as, I'm going to use another word, fair as possible, right? We don't want people falsely accused. We don't want people put in jail when they shouldn't be. And yet we all know full well those things happen. We can't really control all of that, even with the best of our justice system or our, our court system, right? So let us now leave earth and the world behind and let us go up into the heavenly courts and ask God, how does it work in your courtroom? We yet have a convict, only in the scripture we call them a sinner, right? How guilty? 100%. That isn't just 100% as in all the people, 100%. It is that. But it is also each of you and I are 100%. Guilty. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1 and 2, right in there. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 100% fallen short. Which means Daniel, this is the interesting thing to me, Daniel who, we have no record of his mistake. Do we? We have no record of him sinning against God. It's not in there. I'm not saying he wasn't a sinner. I'm just saying we have no record. There's no, you know, well, here's what he did. Like Abraham lied twice about his wife, uh, slept with the wrong one, had the wrong child. See, we have those details about many. Daniel, we have nothing. And Daniel's the guy who's saying, God, I 
and my people have sinned. It's more amazing that Daniel's the one saying it because we can't find in his life reason for him to say that. But the honesty which with, he, which with, which, <laughs> with which he speaks is clear and it is true. I and my people, Lord, we have sinned against thee. That's 100% sinner. Now, the, the good news starts right here because who is the judge? God? Jesus, God the Father, Jesus. How many of you would vote if you get to choose uh, for God the Father? You want him to be judge? Couple, okay. How many would rather have Jesus? Why is that? Jesus lived here. Jesus lived here. He understands me better than the Father, right? That's what you were going to say? He was given the authority. He was given the authority, <laughs> Okay. Uh, why would you pick Jesus over the Father? We do that, right? She says he's nicer. He's nicer, right? We have these concepts about God. He's the heavy. He's the justice. Jesus is the... So we naturally gravitate towards the mercy side again. Is that really true? John 5.22. Somebody looked that up for us, and I lost my microphone. I put it over here. Somebody read for us John 5.22. Who is the judge? Somebody that would like to read it. Anyone? She's got it? Okay. And the Father leaves all judgment to his Son. And the Father leaves all judgment to his Son. Any version say it different? Yours? Edie? Mine says... Um, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Father judges how many? No one. No one. Can, can that be true? Jesus is the one talking, right? Talking to his disciples, talking to the Israelites, talking to those who are around him, even from other nations who are hearing, and he says the Father judges no one. Now you can imagine the woman who was thrown at Jesus' feet for adultery, how she would respond to that line. She had been taught that God would never give her a chance. Not after what she'd done. There's no coming back, right? Your sin is too great. The Father will not unless you first prove to him that you can stop and that you can never do it again and so on and so on and so on. And that kept falling apart in her life until she was so discouraged she thought there was never going to be any hope for her. And she sees Jesus, who writes in the sand, and all the accusers are quiet now and gone away, <clears throat> And he says, I don't condemn you. I didn't come here for that, John chapter 3, right? I didn't come to condemn but to save. She had never heard that idea before. She says, man, this guy is amazing. If he's a prophet, if he's a, a, a teacher, if he's, if he's Messiah, there might be hope for me. That's what happened in her mind. Hope sprung up for the first time. And when she heard this line... The great almighty Father in heaven is not going to judge you. He's going to let me do that. What would her response be? Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're going to set aside your justice and that you're going to let Jesus take care of that because he's so merciful. Was she right about that part? Are they different? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, but she didn't know that yet. That's coming later in the book of John when Jesus says that, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But she was a good student. She learned to stop listening to men, I mean people. <laughs> stop listening to men and listen to God. Listen to Jesus and what he has to say about all this. The Father judges no one. He's going to let it go. And now in John 12, we're much closer to the crucifixion. He's coming to a a more clear point, okay? John 12, give everyone a second to get there. John 12, 46 and 47. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He, he will judge or he won't judge? He won't. He won't, your version says that? Maybe that's a mistaken version. Anybody else to say it differently? Sherry? 
I will not judge those who hear me but don't obey me, for I have come to save the world and not to judge it. Now, now if you listen closely, we would expect that to say he will not judge those who believe in him. Right? But what did it say? He will not judge those who reject him. He will not judge the wicked. He will not judge, and, and we're going, wait a minute. If God isn't going to judge, and Jesus isn't going to judge, well, there has to be a judge, doesn't there? So who is the judge? Yes, in the back. Now, that's a long way for me to go with the microphone, but we're going to do it. Okay, here I come. The judgment for them is they've judged themselves by their own choices and actions. Good. Good thought. Let's see if we can build that scripturally, build that so we know that to be true, because we, we've got to have a judge somewhere, I thought. If you, read, if you read further, it says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So who is the judge? The word, she says. Everybody else's version say the same thing in some fashion or another. The word which I have spoken, it will judge you. Now, that, that's like messing up the whole system because we went from a person to what? A word or, or a truth. The Greek actually says, this is just in English, the Greek will say the very message which I delivered to you, that will judge you. The message which I delivered, that will judge you. Wait a minute, again, suddenly a person sort of faded out a little bit in our minds, and we're thinking, what, like a scroll or, or, or a book, or what are we talking about? The word, the message which I have delivered to you, it will judge you. Check your version, see if it really says that. Got a thought right here. I think it's, I think it's talking about the Ten Commandments. Okay, so maybe the Ten Commandments is sitting in, like, the throne, right? And you have the tables of stone sitting there. The very message. What's the message that Jesus delivered? What is it? Life, love, what else? What was the message they needed so badly that with all their reading of scriptures, they still didn't have? Father loved them. The truth about God which was standing before them. That's why when Philip said, well, show it to us, Jesus says, you've been looking at it for three and a half years, right? Jesus is the revelation of the Father. He's also the revelation of the, we're going to use the word law. No problem with that word, actually. When we understand that the law is a transcript of God's character, it was trying to point us to what God was like. But we keep rewriting it, the law, to match us. And so we put a picture behind the law of a God who's like us, who gets frustrated, who gets angry and starts swinging, start accusing and condemning. And we've got this God in our mind who's judging and condemning and critical. Isn't that what the Jews were like in the time of Christ? You see, the problem was that they had the wrong God. So much so that when they looked at Jesus, they thought he was who? The devil. That's not just kind of confused. That's completely confused, right? To look at Jesus and call him the devil. So here in the scriptures, it's telling us a very important thing. We need to stop thinking of a God who's judgmental and critical, who's going to be our judge, and understand the father said, no, I'm going to let my son do that. And then his son says, oh, and by the way, I'm not going to do it either. John 3, 16, 17, right? Came not to judge and condemn, but to save. And so in 12... Just write it up here. 46 through 48 tells us. Sorry, that makes it echo when I do that. <clears throat> tells us that it's the truth about God that is the judge. Is that okay? Yes. He came to, he came to fulfill the law. Good. And in fulfilling the law, doesn't that mean that he fulfilled it entirely? So if he fulfilled it entirely, did he show us every piece of the law of God? Did he reveal it in clarity? And here's how he revealed it. 
We beat on him, we spit on him, we whipped him, and what did he say? I love you, I forgive you, do unto others, love your neighbor as yourself. He had all of it going, all at once. And yet we're still having all these discussions about the law, the law, the law. You know, Sister White said that. She said, I wish that we were no longer the people who, who, who had said of them that we teach the law, the law, the law. I thought that was our job. I thought that's what we were called into action to do, was to help everybody else understand. They got to quit throwing away the law, right? We've been focused on that. But Jesus, he was the only perfect presentation of what the law really is. When he laid down his life for you and me, he was presenting the law. That isn't the way we've been treating the law. That's not the way we've been treating our neighbors with the law, right? We like to hit them with it, point out their problems. And yet God has been asking us, can I write the law where? So we find out that God has presented the truth, not just in, sorry, tables of stone, but through his son. That's the presentation of the truth about God. And now we find out this. God will give you, sorry, I can't write today. So God will give you choice. What is your choice? What are your options? Choose you this day. I know we like, you know, choose you this day whom you serve. That was the problem on the top of Mount Carmel. But if on top of Mount Carmel, they had no fire from heaven to define the difference between the true God and the false God, could those people have made their choice? No. In other words, there was Israelites on top of the mountain who really believed that Baal was the true God. They were praying to the true God, they thought. Then there were Israelites who were absolutely sure it was not the right God, but they weren't brave enough to say anything to help their neighbors, to lay down their life for their neighbors. Then there was the larger group on top of Mount Carmel who weren't really sure, but wanted to know. So God takes care of all three groups at once. He shows up and he presents his fire or character. He presents himself so that it can be seen who is God. That's a very simplistic form of it. In today's time, we're talking about a revelation of the character of God, not just physical fire, right? And as that revelation comes to us, we have a choice. Will we accept it as true, even though it is contrary to what's in me, contrary to what I think, contrary to what I've been taught? You see, that was the Israelites' problem. What Jesus was saying did not coincide with what they'd been taught all their lives. And they were in a predicament. Who do we believe? Who do we listen to? We got voices over here and voices over there. And then there's this weird guy coming around that nobody's ever heard of. He used to be a carpenter. And we're not even sure. Everybody's calling him an illegitimate child. How could he even have any power to teach truth? That's what the Pharisees said, right? Who gave you this right? And Jesus said, well... Anybody who wants to know the will or the heart of God so they can do it and follow it, they will know what is the truth. It seems like a weird formula. But what he was saying is anybody who's open-hearted, who hears and sees the truth about God presented in Jesus, they will know that it's truth. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will open their mind to it and confirm it in them. They'll see that it's true. So now we have this choice. God, God's going to give this two opportunities, two, two directions of possibility. One is God's jail. It's not spelled H-E-L-L. -L. God's jail, which is his reform school. How many of you have been to reform school? Anybody? Yeah, we don't like going to those, do we? <laughs> because reform school is supposed to be about what? Reform. Re reforming my heart. Now, I, I don't mean earthly reform school. God's reform school is going about reforming our hearts. Create in me a clean heart. This is the power of grace on the heart, on the life. This is the school of grace, the, the law of peace that, that Christ offers us to enter into, to come to know him and be changed into his likeness by his power, not ours. The other offer, the other option is the one Satan said we needed. We need to be free from grace. That's what Satan said. Free from grace. 
what would it be to be free from grace? Why would you want to be free from grace? Well, when we say it that way, of course we don't want to be separated from that. But what we chose in the very beginning when we ate the fruit, grandpa and grandma, right? We chose to be separated from God. Like the tree branch broken off the tree. How, how is that going to work? Tree branch is now laying on the ground. And what's it doing? Dying. Dying. And it cannot live. It cannot continue. But if you could take that branch and graft it back in, oh, something could happen, right? This is the simple concept of free from grace, separated from God, right? Having no, no ability to see him or know him or understand him. Actually, it becomes choosing the lie, right? What is the results of this? Death is the inevitable results. And the gift of God? Eternal life. Okay, there's our, there's our simple construction of the concepts of how this kingdom works. God says, you're a sinner. You've warred against him. How many of you chose to be born in sin? Nobody? God knows that. God doesn't come to you and say, you should have known better. He says, you were born in that, having cancer called sin, but I want to fix it. That's this side, right? But after seeing this presentation of God, which comes through Jesus Christ, the question is, will I submit every piece of my thinking to him? Will I see him willing to turn the other cheek? Will I see him speaking kindly to those who hated him, to those who were not nice to him? Will I see Jesus treating people that way and say, Lord, I'm in trouble because that is not my nature. My nature is to be, you used the word, was it frustrated or angry? Angry, I think he said. Angry. Our nature is to be angry. Our nature is to be frustrated. Our nature is to hit somebody because they did something to me. And Jesus said, I know you heard it said that you need to be nice to your friends and hate your the one who used to be your friend yesterday but did something now you don't like, right? He said, no, that isn't it, right? Pray for those who despitefully use you. Become like your Father in heaven, who while you were enemies against God, he sent his son to say, I would like to have you come home, prodigal son, who wanted his father dead, right? That's what's going on here, but now comes choice. And I don't mean a one-time choice. I don't mean, you know, Peter, he made a choice, and then he totally failed. So I'm not talking about it in an instant. We're talking about as this revelation of God is revealed to us, how we respond today, tomorrow, the next day, and ongoing days, right? Do we respond like Daniel, who said, Lord, we're in trouble. I know we're supposed to be the chosen remnant people, but we're not doing too good. That would be honest. Laodicea message, of course, we're not going to beat on that one because we've used that so many times. But we know what it says, filthy, blind, poor, naked, honest, Lord, we're in trouble, we need help. And we can enter into this experience of grace or we can reject him for eternity. Now, here comes our words, justice and mercy. If the sinner who's 100% guilty <clears throat> comes to understand the truth about God's love, his pre-forgiveness, his willingness to save and rescue and then chooses, well, let me back up. Sinner, 100% guilty, deserves what? Justice says he gets what? Life or death. Okay, so we better put justice down this side. Mercy says? If he's guilty, 100%, mercy would give him life or grace. That's normally how we look at it. I was jumping ahead there, so now think about it in these terms. If that sinner came to Christ and, and started to understand all that God had to offer, this life change to have, have his love in the heart and then pushed it away a little bit at a time and, and ultimately rejected it for eternity. Would it be merciful for God to give that one death? Would it be merciful for God to give one over to death? Who understood, who saw the truth, and then yet rejected it. Anybody think no? I'm wearing you out already. <laughs> okay, that's, that's absolutely correct. We would see that God, who, who revealed himself to them, if then they rejected it, 
it would be merciful to give them to death. Here's why that's important. Would it be merciful for God to force them to go to heaven with him? Or to live with him in eternity in his presence? Because, you know, there's nowhere that he isn't, right? Go up to heaven and he's there. Go down to hell and he's there. He's everywhere. So if they hate him so, would it be merciful to force them to live with him for eternity? No. So in mercy, he will let them go. I want to talk about that just a little bit more because we jumped over wrath. How do you think he feels about those ones right there? He's not willing that any should perish. We're at the third coming now in our discussion. What's happening? He has no, pleasure in the death of no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So my teacher was wrong. I'm going to get what they deserve. I'm not blaming him. We were taught these things. I don't know where it started except to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We'll stick with that. <laughs> no blame other than that, right? But these ideas, where did we get them from? Satan taught us that God is seeking whom he may destroy. But the scripture says Satan is the one who's seeking whom he may destroy and devour, right? And so we need to, we need to look at that third coming for a moment. Because here's, here's the... Let me just read you a couple of amazing quotes here. Let me get this back open. Here's a description. Listen to this for a moment, talking about God the Father. Had, had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us instead of Jesus, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him, the Father, the history that we have of God on the earth would not have changed even a tiny bit. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instructions, we are to see, hear, and recognize God. In sight and in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. Do we know that to be true from the Bible? How do we know that? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's another one. Jesus said, I do nothing of myself, but I only do that which the Father gave me to do. I do the works of my Father in my Father's house. He's always talking about what God is like. We're to see in every move of Jesus the movements of the Father. So we can find out things like this. If it'll turn the page. We have this idea that we're taught about that there's, this, there's a limit to this grace right here, right? This is, grace is actually here and all the way down this side. Don't, don't mistake that it's only here. It's this whole thing. God pours his grace on everyone, and then those who choose to dwell in it, they go down this side. God reveals his grace to everyone, and some just push it off and reject it. But we teach this idea that there's a limit to this grace or this mercy, right? I mean, God will take it so far, and after that, that's it. He's had enough. You heard that before? Is that true? How do we know it's not true? I mean, it looks like it in the Old Testament, right? I mean, he had enough of Sodom and Gomorrah. His love is everlasting. His love is everlasting. His that, oh, there you go. Psalms, yeah. his mercy endureth. Forever. Is that the forever that only lasts as long as it lasts? <laughs> I keep hearing about that. Only lasts as long as it lasts. Because we take this idea of fire that is eternal, and then we do this fancy trick that says, oh, but it's only as long as it lasts. We won't get off into that track. <laughs> this is the forever, this is the same, actually, forever word as about the fire. It never runs out. But watch what this says. This will help explain it. There is a, there is a limit to this grace. See, I told you. <laughs> watch what it says. Mercy may plead for years with you, and it may be slighted and rejected. And there comes a time when mercy makes her last plea. Hmm? Here comes. The heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God. Was that God running out of mercy? No. See, we, we, we've misquoted this thing right here. I've heard it said many times uh, from pulpits even where we say, there's a limit to this grace. You know, God will run out of mercy at some point. That isn't what it says. The heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God. Is that really possible? Yeah, Judas did it. Judas lived with Jesus three and a half years. He was intimately acquainted 
with Jesus, his work, his ministry, his heart, the way he treated people. He watched it day in and day out. And yet he decided at the end, you know what? If I have to become a servant like that, I don't want it. That was the bottom line for Judas. Uh, Sister White even says that to Judas, as to none of the other disciples, was given a revelation, a clearer understanding for some reason before the cross. It's like God wanted him to see the, the whole thing because if he's going to deny Christ, he's going to do it with full knowledge. That was the mercy of God. He revealed to Judas and Judas saw Jesus was not here to conquer the Romans. Judas saw he was not here to have an earthly kingdom. He was not here to build up castles and have treasuries and have money and build a, build a system of organization. He was here for what reason? To be a servant to you, servant to me, one who would help us and rescue us in our time of trouble. Here's the rest of the quote. The heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God. Then the sweet winning voice entreats the sinner no longer. Reproofs and warnings cease. But you notice it only ceases after it's tried beyond. Here's where we see proof for that. And I, and I love this part about this picture right here on this side <clears throat> having to do with God's character because Jesus was crucified and then he told his disciples to work where? First. In Jerusalem, Desire of Ages says, Jesus sent the disciples back to the very ones who crucified him and said, give them the first opportunity to receive it. That's not how we do it. Don't give them another opportunity is what we say. Right? Don't let them come in here. They might hurt us again. And, of course, the disciples at first, they're hiding from that. They're in the upper room. This is before they got it. But once they got it at Pentecost, right in Jerusalem, they started giving the same offer of mercy and grace to the very ones who had crucified Christ. Now, not only did they do that, but three and a half years of that, and they stoned who? Stephen. Stephen. And Stephen gives this amazing sermon, and in the sermon at the end, just before he dies, and he looks up into heaven, and he sees the glory of God, what does he say? Hold this not against them. Why? He just justified them. Not to get into a fancy complication about justification. He just said they're not guilty because they don't know what they're doing. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's not possible. They killed Christ. They've been telling him for three and a half years. They've been throwing him in jail and whipping and spitting on even the disciples. And Stephen, oh, wait a minute, it wasn't Stephen. Who was it talking? Jesus. The Holy Spirit talking. And the Holy Spirit said through Stephen, hold this not against them. He's talking to us. Hold this not against your neighbor or your brother in the pew or on the board, right? Hold this not against them. They don't know what they're doing. Instead, Love them the way Jesus did. Because Jesus now says, yeah, I know they killed Stephen, but we're going to give them a little more time. How much more time? What's 40 minus 3 and a half? Uh, 36 and a half, right? Or, no, 36 and a half. Right? Because it was 40 years from the, from the time of the crucifixion until what? Destruction of Jerusalem. Sister White says that what was happening in Jerusalem 40 years after the cross, that God had to give the people over to the God of their choice, which was whom? Satan. And Satan was unleashed, so to speak, upon them because of whose choice? Their choice. They had, they had stopped listening to the sweet voice of offer for rescue. They said, we would have a king, but it will not be that king. It will be Satan, our king. Ellen White describes it as though they were chained to his car. And he's tearing down the, the highway, so to speak, and they're just locked into this. Why? Because they chose the deception about God. They chose to continue wanting to have a God who's going to say, well, when, when, when you do wrong, I'm going to whip up on you. Because I'm going to come to you with my justice, and I'm going to pound them into the dirt. We want that kind of God. Why? Because we want our enemies destroyed. God came to his enemies and said, I did not come to destroy. I did not come to condemn. I came to rescue, to save, to love, to help, to nurture, to lay down his life. See, this is the difference between these two gods. But here comes God now, and he's in tears weeping over Jerusalem. 
How do I know that? Because in the Bible, when he did the woes of the Pharisees, how did he finish the woes to the Pharisees? We like that part, woe to the Pharisees, right? Really give it to them. But what came at the end of the woes of the Pharisees? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How much, how for long years, I wanted to rescue you. Wanted to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks. But you have refused my offer of companionship and love and oneness in the heart. You chose a different God. And so I have to step back and let you turn you over to that. And suddenly they're killing each other and stealing each other's food. You know there was a year's supply. I've heard this. This isn't from the Bible, so don't quote me on this. But I heard there was a year's supply of food to, to feed the whole nation for a year inside Jerusalem when it was besieged. Well, that's a long time. The siege didn't last that long. What was the problem? They were so selfish and so hateful and so backbiting of one another that they would steal each other's food and kill each other and destroy the food in the process. They wrecked a whole lot of supplies just because they were filled with what? Anger and rage and vengeance against one another. They didn't trust each other. Suddenly there was no trust in anybody. Everybody became their enemy, right? Right inside the city. Got so bad they even had to kill their own children and eat them. Sorry, parents, that's what happened. Sick, sad story, but that hatred and that vengeance and that anger of the God who they followed had taken over their hearts and their lives, and that's what they did. Until finally, in mercy, try this one, in mercy, God sends Titus to put a stop to it. Because here's where I'm going with that. It is just and merciful for God to give them over to the God of their choice, but not when they don't understand not when they don't know. Not until the truth has been revealed and been rejected. Then it is merciful. One more time on this side. Sinner, 100% guilty, comes to see the truth about God. If he then chooses to submit and surrender to that God and be transformed by that God, is it just in the court of heaven to give such a one life, to give them grace, to work on their heart? It's justice because Jesus paid the price. Okay. And we're going to get into that one this afternoon about paying the price. But I want you just first to accept or look at this idea. I shouldn't say accept because you really need to test this all by the word of God. But look at this idea about God saying, you know what? They were deceived. Here's what it says in Desire of Ages. In the chapter called It Is Finished, it says, Satan, as to no other created being, had been given a revelation of God's character. Knowing that goodness and character, Satan chose to follow his own selfish, independent will. That's what I just described, rejection, right? Then it goes on the very next line to say, but man was deceived. To him, to man, there might be hope. Through a revelation of the truth about God, man might be drawn back to God. Why might? He's not going to force them to be drawn back. He's going to reveal it to how many? All. All. But then he's going to give them choice, and so they might be drawn back to God. That's why the cross on my picture is here, not here. We'll discuss that in more detail later. Nonetheless, the cross was needed to deliver this message of mercy, but I want you just to open our, our thoughts to the verse that says, God is both just and the justifier of him who believes, and, and if we put justice here, watch what happens. We used to think that justice and mercy were different. Justice and mercy actually opposed each other. One said to kill them. The other said to let them off. One said to put them in prison or jail, and one said to help them. But which one of those is God? See, God has to be both simultaneously. That's what he promised. Satan made up all this other idea over here. This is based on Satan's government, but this is God's. God said, in my kingdom it doesn't work that way. I reveal the truth, and I let you choose to submit and be changed or to reject and be separated from the source of life. And if you choose that, will he love you? Yes, yes he will. Will he forgive you for being such a stubborn, rebellious child? Yes. But can he save you? In his mercy, he has to let you go, if you choose that. 
But if you say to him, yes, transform me, it is both just and merciful for him to work in your heart and bring you back into the kingdom of God. Suddenly, God's justice and mercy isn't like we thought. Justice says, you get what you choose. And mercy says, you get what you choose. See, we're still stuck on those old ones. Has nothing to do with deserving. Who deserves life? Is there an angel that's been righteous enough to deserve life? No? No? Never thought about that, huh? <laughs> the angels aren't up there having eternal life because they deserve it. They don't even think that way. They're there, why? Because God, in his love and his grace and his mercy, has given them life, and they celebrate that gift by serving you and I. You know, it says all heaven has stopped. There's no business going on up there. There's no activity. There's no buying and selling. There's no building businesses or any other such transactions. They're all busy doing one thing. Do you know what it is? Trying to rescue us. Now, if all heaven can stop, what are we so busy doing? We have no time to be saved. No time to be changed. No time to lay our life down and serve our brother, serve our sister. No time to stop and make them important the way Jesus made them. We've been duped. Somebody told us it was your duty to be so busy, B-U-S-Y, bound under Satan's yoke. And Jesus said, my yoke, it is easy, and my burden is light. Why? Because this is the God who loves sinners, who desires to transform them and rescue them from what's in them. And if you decide that you hate that, and you hate him, and you want to spit in his face and, and throw him away. He will not stop loving you, but he will let you go. He will give you over to the God of your choice. Choose you this day. That's where it fits. Choose you this day. Will I serve the God that Jesus revealed or some other variation, some other version? And where that comes to that practical part is what do I see working itself out in me? Not by my power. Not by my abilities. But when we see, like for instance, you notice how we, we struggle with all this. I used stress, the word before, but I'm going to use a different one. Cares and worries. The cares of this life, it's called. The worries, I mean, right? We, we rush, rush, rush. We get to Friday and oh. Sabbath, you know, may, maybe we can stay awake. We're tired. We're worn out on trying to get righteous and be righteous and do righteous. And Jesus says, come to me, I will give you Sabbath. That's what it means. Sabbath. Rest from your labors. Rest from your trying to transform yourself. And rest in this very thing. He loves you more than we currently conceive and understand. He's willing to give you everything from heaven to help rescue you. Are we really that stuck to our idols? and stuck to our busyness, that we don't want that? Daniel prayed. And I love the fact that Daniel prayed, and God was so in tune with Daniel. Daniel was so in tune with God, maybe there's a better way to say it, that it was God actually speaking through Daniel so we could hear it. It wasn't Daniel making up that prayer. The Spirit of God was upon Daniel, and he was praying. Remember it says the, the Father knows what you need even before you ask. Same with Daniel. He knew what Daniel needed before he asked. And so he inspired Daniel to pray this prayer, to recognize his need and the need of his people who had been conquered and wiped out by Babylon. Lord, we have sinned against you. And I love the fact that at the end of that prayer, who shows up? Anybody remember? Gabriel shows up. And he says, Daniel, just want you to know, we heard you from when? The moment you started praying. But add in the background, who inspired him to say those words? God. So how could he not know, right? God knew Daniel, ready, on cue, and he starts to pray. Not a fake prayer, not a, a shallow prayer, not a prayer mixed with belief and unbelief, but, but the power and the Spirit of God coming through him 
as he recognized his need and the need of his people because God was already working on the rescue. When did God start working on the rescue of Israel? I'm talking about, you know, the, the conquered by Babylon and now they're in the Medo-Persia. And, and, and when did he start working on rescuing them out of that? Before they went there. Because it was prophesied before they went there that it would be a certain distance of time and God would bring it about. So God was already on the mission. It's interesting that Daniel doesn't seem to be aware of that until most of the way through his career. And then Daniel's reading it in Jeremiah, and the Spirit inspires him. See what I said way back there? Daniel gets it. Daniel now speaks by the Spirit because the Spirit has already prepared it and getting moving and acting. See, this is how the view, when we look back from above, how it looks from heaven. God is the one in motion. God is the one after your heart. Guy gave me a card the other day. I kind of liked it. It said, you're on heaven's most wanted list. Now, if it had a shotgun in the picture, that would be bad. <laughs> but it didn't mean that, right? You're on heaven's most... God wants you. Justice and mercy. We'll conclude with this thought right here. <clears throat> I'm not going to read this too long. Simply the fact that we've got to stop defining God based on what we think and based on what we understand from all of our studies in the school of Pharaoh. And simply stop and say, God, could you explain to me how you're both loving and yet have law, how you're both just and merciful at the same time, and suddenly the picture starts to gel. If this is a new idea or you're not sure, and that's okay, you can tell me, Bobby, I think you're all wrong, just invite you to try Desire of Ages chapter 1 and then Great Controversy chapter 1. The reason I say that is a lot of Adventists, which I am one, I have asked them, have you read these chapters? Oh, yeah. What are your favorite chapters? And they'll always tell me something in the last eight chapters of Great Controversy or the, or the Calvary chapter in, in Desire of Ages. That seems to be a favorite. Or, or the, the very end, the sort of go teach all nations part. I right? would kind of lock into that. But in Desire of Ages chapter 1 and in Great Controversy chapter 1 is where I got all this. It's right there in the chapters. Add to that John, the whole book. And go through John, the whole book, and every time you find a, a verse that says something about judgment or judging, write it down. Make a list. And you'll find this very interesting thing. Jesus said, we read it, the Father judges no one. And then he says, but I'm not going to judge anyone either. But in John 9, which is before 12, he says, for judgment I came into the world. Here's the good news about judgment. What he's saying in John is judgment doesn't work the way you thought. We don't do it like the kings of the earth. Here's how we do it in heaven. We reveal to those who are deceived the truth. And we woo them and draw them and we work on their hearts. And if they accept me, I will move into their hearts and live there. If they reject me out of love, I will let them go. That is the judgment that we are supposed to be teaching. That is the judgment. How could you not share that with your neighbors? my favorite activity. And it is connected to that verse, fear God and give him glory. But just before that, there was another verse that says that angel was carrying what? Everlasting gospel. That's the angel that says, fear God and give him glory. He first presents the goodness of God. That's right here. And then he says, now it's time for everybody, after seeing the goodness of God, to start being separated into one of two groups. That's what happened in Israel. Some were accepting, some were rejecting. Some who rejected later changed their mind and accepted. Some who looked like they were accepting ultimately rejected, but when the story was done, it's very clear who was where. And so God is working to bring to this earth the revelation of God's character so that it will separate the wheat and the tares. It'll cause the shaking in our church because it'll separate between those whose hearts prefer the God who likes to destroy versus the God who is seeking to save. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to think about these things. But again, we need your spirit to lead us and teach us into all truth, not just accept ideas because Bobby said it or somebody else said it, but really to dig. Move on our hearts that we will open the pages, not to earn points and not to create spirituality in our lives, but to drink you in to really just behold you and what you're like, that we might align our lives and want our, our lives aligned with you and your character and your spirit. We thank you for this Sabbath 
for the chance to spend uh, the day together and have a meal and to discuss these things. In Jesus' name, amen.